Good afternoon, everyone. It is 1.05 p.m., and that means it's time for another of Western Liberty Network's ongoing installments of our Saturday Zoom sessions, where we train people in particular skills they can use to be successful in politics where they live. And today we're going to be talking about how to provide written testimony on whether it's bills at the legislature or ordinances in your city council or county commission or whatever it is, we'll uh, discuss how to do that uh, very briefly. I need to outline that Western Liberty Network is a 501c3 organization, and we do not, therefore, um, endorse or oppose any political party or any political candidate, even the ones we train. Uh, and that uh, opinion stated in, in these sessions or at WLN events are, you know, the responsibility of those who offer them and do not necessarily represent the views of Western Liberty Network. Um, I'm going to very quickly. Uh, for those who will be watching the recording later, I will uh, share the screen for just a moment. And here you will see uh, the Western Liberty Network website. This is what you see if you go to westernlibertynetwork.org. And at the very top here, you'll see uh, what we're doing at the moment. And right now we're focusing on over 7,000 local nonpartisan races up for election in Oregon and Washington. And this talks about how people can get involved in those races. Um, the deadline has passed for a local nonpartisan race filings in Oregon, but there are still some seats out there for no one has filed and a write-in campaign can still result in victory. Uh, the Washington races begin in May and go all the way to November. And this document here from the Special District Association of Oregon is a very good document on the responsibilities of a commissioner and the powers of a commissioner and all of that. So if anyone's thinking of running or if anyone watching this recording is a candidate, that is an excellent document. Scrolling further down, you can see what Western Liberty Network is doing. This space talks about our Saturday trainings, and this relates to the one we're offering right now. Scroll down more and you'll find things about our uh, uh, various events. This was our conference back in February. Um, and these are other things. And there are various resources you can click here to see slideshows on different trainings. In this case, how to use social media if you're a candidate or if you're just supporting a campaign. Anyway, scroll down, you'll find something that's interesting and uh, there'll be a lot of information there. If you go to the training tab on Western Liberty Network, uh, at the top, it talks about the kind of training that we provide. Scroll down, you can see training documents. Each of these is designed to be held or provided with a live training, but they stand up on their own. So if you want to learn how to gather signatures in Oregon, for example, click here and you'll see this, the training document on how to do that thing. You can look at as many of these as you like. They're all free to download and feel free to distribute them. If you want to download all of them with one click, just click down here and you'll get one uh, document with all of them that you can download. And then finally, <clears throat> these are the recordings of our weekly sessions and this recording will be added um, as soon as we're finished here. And between the written documents you can download and the recordings of the video sessions that you can view here, you can literally design a custom training curriculum for yourself. Uh, if you decide you like what we do, go to support WLN and you can make a recurring or one-time tax deductible contribution securely through PayPal that will support the efforts of Western Liberty Network. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and come back here and we will start the training on how to provide written testimony. Now I've got a couple of things here. I'm gonna provide some documents through the chat window. Uh, I want to remind everyone that we do have training on how to provide oral testimony and I'm not gonna go over it today because today is about written testimony. But I'm going to go ahead and provide the training document on oral testimony. Uh, if you get a chance to testify in person, it is a great thing to do if you can. And uh, this training document will provide you with some tips. Um, so with that, we're going to go next into our document here, which I will also upload for you. This is on written testimony, and you can follow along. I can make the computer work. 
There we go. Okay. Okay, this is a new document, so it isn't all polished up yet, but all the information is there. And we're going to go through this uh, bit by bit. And this is on how to write written testimony. I encourage people, even if they offer oral testimony, to also provide written testimony. Written testimony is always a good idea. It's very powerful. It ensures that you're going to be able to do some things you might not be able to with oral testimony. A lot of times if you give oral testimony to a board or a commission, you only get two minutes, sometimes three if you're lucky. And that isn't always enough time to get in all the points you can make. You can usually get in one argument, uh, and that's what I train people to do if they're doing oral testimony, provide one argument and only one argument. And sometimes if there are a lot of people who want to testify, you don't get to. Um, I was at a hearing on the 21st, and they said, we're going to go until 730. And at that time, they had some legislators testify, and they had some experts testify, and they had some citizens testify. But when 730 came, and they decided to adjourn, there were probably 80% of the people who wanted to testify didn't get a chance to. So to avoid this happening to you, make sure you provide a written testimony, because written testimony is always put into the record, um, whether it's read or whether it's not read, it always goes into the record, and it's always important to have that there. If you can do both, it's great, because written and oral testimony can sort of reinforce each other, and you can continue to, uh, um, to lobby for or against your bill or your ordinance or whatever you're trying to do. Uh, so we always encourage people to offer this. Now, when providing written testimony, it's important that you, if you're going to be delivering the documents yourself, make sure there are enough copies of your written testimony, along with your supporting documents, for every person on the committee. I testified a week or so ago to the Behavioral Health and Healthcare Committee, and I provided 11 copies of my testimony, one for every member of the committee, and I provided five more for the committee administrator and other members of the staff. It's important that you do that. Now, a lot of people submit testimony online, and that's okay. Um, when you submit it online, you don't have to worry about the number of copies that you have. Uh, but if you are in person, make sure you provide written copies. And if you are going to be talking to lawmakers, uh, make sure you always have some copies of your written testimony with you, even if you've already testified and even if you've already submitted online. If you get to talk to a commissioner or a state legislator, hand them a copy of your testimony and uh, invite them to look at it. And uh, that's always a good idea. It, it, it adds to your professionalism, it adds to your image, and as substance to a meeting, and it's always good to give people an opportunity to see what it is that you've worked on. Now, take into account that your testimony might not be read by the policymakers you are trying to reach. Sometimes, you know, if you're presenting written testimony to a legislative committee, sometimes there are legislators who read everything. I love those people. You know, they read every bit of testimony that's out there. Uh, but those people are rare. Most of the time, they will read a sampling of the testimony. And if they read um, a testimony, they will only read the first couple of paragraphs enough to get the gist of what the person is saying. And then they move on to the next one, just because they have so much to do. Other legislators don't read testimony at all. They tell their legislative aides or staff members to read the testimony and then brief them on anything interesting that they find. Uh, and that's all okay. The important thing is that you provide this testimony and that somebody reads it. Somebody reads it in part or in total. But when you write these documents, write them in a way that bears this in mind, that it may be the policymaker or maybe the legislative aid. This is why sometimes when I write testimony in the form of a letter, I'll address it to the legislator I'm trying to, to reach but I also address it to the staff member. It doesn't have to be by name, just be the staff member. Staff uh, members don't get a lot of respect and they're oftentimes harassed by people working for or against a bill, um, you know, trying to pressure them to 
open up a meeting or do these sorts of things, they will love you if you treat them respectfully, you treat them as a peer of your legislator, and you involve them in your policy discussions. It'll uh, make it, you know, you'll, you'll be respecting them, they will appreciate it, and they'll show it in a variety of ways. Your testimony will be the one that gets passed to the legislator. Your testimony will be the one that they read. Your appointment request will be more likely to be the one that is granted. So bear that in mind when you're writing your testimony. Now, um, what I also try to do is I encourage people, if you write testimony, after you've submitted it, call the office of everyone on the committee that you provided testimony to and remind them of your testimony, ask if they've seen it, ask if they're aware of it, ask if they need another copy of it, whatever it is they need, um, more copies of the documentation. This provides um, you with a chance to keep your testimony at the top of the minds of the legislative staff and maybe even the legislators that you're dealing with. So what I would do is on the Behavioral Health and Healthcare Committee that I testified before and offered written testimony to, um, I would call the committee members and say, um, you know, I know I submitted it online and uh, um, I'm glad that you gave me that opportunity, but I just want to make sure that it is um, in your, you know, in your mind. If it's that it's available, that your attention is on it, that you, you know, bother to check this out. Did you receive the testimony? You know, do you, are you aware of what it is? Do you have any questions? And by calling the committee uh, offices, that will help to make sure that staff members, when they are looking at testimony, will make it a point to look at your testimony. And if it's compelling, it'll be more likely that they will pass it along, or at least the gist of the testimony, onto the legislative official. So uh, a lot of times these people get lots of testimony and they have to wade through it. Do something to make your testimony stand out. And that is to call them and follow up and see if they've read the testimony, if they have any questions about it, make yourself available as a resource. And that will help your testimony to stand out. Are there any questions so far? Okay, and Donna, you're going to have to pose your questions on the meeting chat. I am keeping an eye on that just in case anything pops up. And I know, Ginger, you've got voice ability. So if you have a question, just go ahead and ask. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, here is an effective way to structure your written testimony. And this is very similar in a lot of ways to uh, an expository form when you were in high school. Uh, if you ever had to write an expository essay, it's not really that different. And you'll begin with an introduction. Uh, you'll introduce yourself. You'll tell them your name, who you are, what your title is, what the name of the organization is you represent, if any. Um, all of these things, uh, if there are any special qualifications or credentials you have, um, then also as a part of the introduction, tell them what you are testifying about. I am testifying against House Bill 3090 or you know, Deschutes County Ordinance 123 or whatever it is, and um, tell them what you want them to do. Uh, you know, if a policymaker uh, only reads this paragraph, they'll at least know what it, who you are, what it is you want, and what you want them to do. Make sure that that is in the introduction. It's a little different than an introduction for an essay, and it's a little different than an introduction for like a letter. But in this case, we want the legislator or the staff member who reads this to know who you are, what you want them to do <clears throat> in the first paragraph. And that way, if they read no further, they'll at least get that much. So put that in your introduction. Secondly, offer a preview of your testimony. I don't always follow this myself. It depends on the number of arguments you have and it depends on you know, what it is they want by way of information. But if you don't have any, uh, any uh, guidance along those lines, provide a, ri a written preview of your testimony. Uh, this is a forecast. Uh, you're going to say, you're going to tell the reader what the main points you're going to make in this document. And uh, you're going to um, not provide a lot of detail, but you're going to tell them the points you're making. You're going to tell them what you want them to do. That way, if they only read this document, 
or if they only read, you know, through this paragraph, you know, the first paragraph will tell them who you are, uh, what your qualifications are, what you want them to do. Um, the second one will sort of provide a preview summary of what the arguments are and, uh, you know, why the arguments are important and how the arguments relate to your position on the policy at hand. Um, if they read no further than this, they'll at least get the gist of what your arguments are. So you've got that right up top. Next, provide the arguments themselves. Lay them out one at a time, present them individually. Try not to mix them. Sometimes one argument will relate to another and you can refer to the argument you laid out above or the argument you're going to lay down below, but make sure that your arguments are laid out one at a time in the order in which they were presented uh, in your preview. You know, the second paragraph, the Roman numeral two. It's gonna outline what your arguments are. Make sure that when you get to the arguments, Roman numeral three, that you put them in the order which you laid them out in your preview. And generally, you should have your most important arguments up front. Have your most important argument first, your second most important argument second, and so on and so forth. That way, if they don't read the entire document, you're not going to bury the lead. You're going to make sure that your uh, most effective arguments are presented out front. You always have to look at these documents from the perspective of someone who is wading through a lot of material. Um, if they're going through a lot of material and they want to save time, they will read until it's not interesting anymore. So you've got to put the interesting stuff up top. They're going to read until what they see is redundant and they've already read 50 times. Make sure that you've got your unique, powerful arguments up top. And in each case, what you're going to do is you're going to make a contention. Um, you're going to provide some evidence in support of that contention. For example, if you're doing something on school choice, uh, you can say something like um, uh, private and charter schools provide incentives for public schools to do better. That would be your argument then provide some support that says that. It says, uh, you know, in Virginia, where they offered public, uh, where public schools had to compete with charter schools and private schools, public schools uh, were 30% more responsive to parents. Some studies, some evidence that shows why your argument is true. And then after you have cited your evidence, sum up by stating what the importance is of your argument to the larger overall point. By making public schools um, have to deal with competition for students, public schools will be better and children will have more choices. See, so you've got the contention that public schools should compete. You've got the evidence saying when they compete, public schools do better. Uh, and then why it's important that if we want to improve education, all of our schools need to be doing better and a competitive environment helps that happen. So that's one argument. The second argument, same thing. Lay down your argument, provide your evidence, and then say why that argument is important within the context of the larger issue. Third, same thing. What is your argument? What is your evidence? Why is it important? Fourth argument, same thing. Go point by point by point, okay? Then when you've gone through your arguments, review your do documents. You know, in the military, they always say, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. That's a way to reinforce learning, and it works here too. You've previewed your arguments here. Um, when I say here, I assume that you can that you can see the screen, but I'm going to share the screen again just a moment. Okay, here we go. So offering written testimony. Here you've got the introduction. This is who you are. This is why you matter. This is why your opinions are relevant. Um, and then this is what you want them to do. Here you're going to preview. In this testimony, I will make three separate points. 
Um, this is point one, this is point two, this is point three. And together you will see that these compelling arguments show you that you should allow competition against government schools. Okay, and that's your preview. And then your arguments, one, two, three. Um, now, one thing important to know about your arguments is that making an argument and documenting it and saying why it's important, you know, that's all key. But if you have personal experience with the issue being dealt with, lay that out. If you have a personal story to share, share it by all means. In politics, compelling and personal stories can often outweigh dry information by lawyers, scientists, statisticians, public office holders. That's all very important. So if you have a personal story, like if you have a special needs child who isn't being served in the government schools, but would be served in a charter school or a private school, weave that into your arguments because that will be compelling. But the point I'm trying to make here is that you will review your arguments just as you previewed them before you made them. So review your arguments. And finally, conclude your document. Here, you thank the public board for their attention to your document. If you were able to give oral testimony, thank them for that as well. Make yourself available to board members if they have questions or want more information. Provide good contact information for yourself. And above all, be accessible in case they want to call you. Um, along with the testimony, provide copies of all of the documentation. Um, you know, with all these arguments, if you've provided evidence, make sure that you provide copies of the articles where you got the evidence from. That's often very, very helpful, and it adds a lot of credibility to your testimony. So provide your testimony. Now, there are some uh, examples I'd like to show you. If you've ever gone on to the Oregon, or I guess Washington, both of you are from Oregon, so I'll do Oregon. Oregon legislative website. I'm gonna share the screen again. This is a page I've asked for. Um, I've gone on to the legislative session and asked for House Bill 3090. This is the bill that I'm working on. This bill, if passed, unamended, would ban all flavored cigarette and tobacco products from being sold in the state of Oregon. Um, and so, you know, we've got a lot of information here. You know, you've got the bill, you've got a list of who the chief sponsors are, a list of who the regular sponsors are, some information about it, and here is the House Committee on Behavioral Health and Healthcare. That is where the bill is right now. So if I look at that, I've got a list of all the committee members and I can contact all of them. If I wanna contact the chair, Representative Rob Nos, takes me to his webpage. And I've got his email address, I've got his phone number, everything I need right there. Getting back to the bill's webpage, Oops, I'm gonna have to bring it up again. Um, this is where you submit testimony. Okay, now uh, if I wanna testify on this bill, I will click on submit testimony. Okay, and this one I can't anymore, they've closed it. But this would bring up a website that lets you enter testimony and you can either type testimony into a window or you can uh, upload PDF files. And so if you make a document with your testimony, you can do um, a PDF file. If you wanna see what people have already written, you can go here, testimony. Here are all the people that have opposed or supported this bill in written testimony. Here is a bit of testimony from Jamie Dunphy of the American Cancer Society. They support the bill. They wanna ban um, 
all of these flavored vapor and tobacco products. And uh, you can look at those. Sometimes regular uh, citizens tes testify. And here's just a short little letter. This person also supports the bill. Um, as you see by looking at these, there are a lot of opponents and a lot of supporters. I think a lot of the opponents came on late and it ended up being pretty even. But I provided some testimony myself here. This is me. So this is my testimony. This is what I provided. See, so there's some unintended consequences. I provide you know, information about evidence. Along with this, I provided also uh, PDFs of the documents that, that uh, generated evidence for this. Uh, this bill is being work sessioned on Monday. Um, but anyway, if you scroll through this, you can do this with any bill, but this is a good sampling of testimony um, provided by both opponents and supporters of this bill. And if you read some of these, and it doesn't matter, it could be on any other bill. Um, I'm not sure a bill number doesn't come in hand. Let's see if I can come up with one. Bills, let's say, I don't even know, I'm just coming up with this number at random, HB2020. Okay, this is HB2020. I don't know what it does. It relates to the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission. What does that do? Uh, it doesn't say. It's in the House Committee of Economic Development and Small Business. This is the committee. I don't know if they've had a work session yet or testimony apparently. Nope, no testimony here. But what you can do is you can go to any bill you want, any bill that you're interested in, and you can look it up on the legislative website. Um, if I go to bills, I can provide the link. See. Provide, I'll provide this link in the chat session. And you can go through this and you can find bills and uh, you can read about bills and committees here. And you can look up testimony and look for examples of testimony. You read the best ones and you're going to find that they are, let's see, that the best ones have most of these elements in them. So you've got examples of the testimony, you've got this document, and you've got one on oral testimony. And so between all of these, it should be possible for uh, you to write quality testimony of your own. Um, if you struggle with it in the beginning, that's okay. Just practice. You get better at this over time. It's like, you know, I always like to use the analogy of playing chess. I can uh, sit here and teach you how to move the pieces, and in 20 minutes, you can actually play a game of chess. But to master it, you've got to play a lot of games. You've got to play uh, people who are better than you are, You've got to build your skill and, you know, you can learn how to play in 20 minutes and take years to become a master. Uh, the same is true for a lot of these skills. The good news is you don't have to be an absolute master to be effective. And if you are writing testimony, you're following up with your testimony by contacting um, the offices and the people you're testifying to. And uh, you have good arguments and you've got good documentation. You should be very effective in providing public testimony in the future. Are there any questions? Or does anyone have anything they'd like to share? Donna, you are sort of the genesis of this training session. Um, has, you know, let me know in the chat window, has this provided you with some of the information that you were hoping to get? Or Ginger, has this been helpful to you at all? Yeah, it has. Yeah, um, I'm glad you showed the legislative uh, site because I think that would be the most helpful. Yep, that's it's it's very helpful. You know, this isn't hard to do. A lot of people are intimidated by the process. You know, I've seen people go into hearing rooms 
and they're intimidated by the dais and the wood paneling and the symbols on the wall and the police officers outside, uh, all of those things. And even those who testify online, they take a look at the state website, a committee website, a bill website, they are intimidated by this. And so I say to folks like that, don't be intimidated. These are just symbols. This is our house. These people work for us. And we have a right to be able to provide this kind of testimony. And you know, don't be intimidated because these symbols of power are really testament to your power, not their power. Because even with everything that has gone on, it is still our government, not theirs. We just have to take ownership of it. And we still need to do uh, what we need to do. Now, I've got something from Donna. In the legislature on most bills, they know the major arguments against or for. So simply adding your personal reasons and not a lengthy repeat, uh, is that effective? Well, yeah, but I'll tell you something. These legislators, they get 4,000 bills a session. And not all of them survive, but all of them have their supporters and all of them have their detractors. Um, they don't know what all the arguments are all the time. Uh, I remember when I worked for Senator George, he just didn't have the time to uh, go over the bills. He would go over the ones that he really thought were important, but he would tell us, the staff members, to go over the other bills and then tell him what to think uh, or even recommend how he should vote on them. I don't blame him for that because there's just too much for anyone to do. Uh, so don't assume that legislators know what the arguments are, what the main arguments are for and against. Um, and uh, But do provide your personal story because your personal reasons how a bill might affect you is very powerful and can sometimes be more powerful than anything that anyone else can say. But do not assume that legislators know what most of the arguments are. You know, a lot of our legislators you know, some of them are brilliant, but a lot of them aren't that bright. Some of them work hard and have good work ethics. Some of them are just lazy and uh, delegate a lot to their staff. And the people who do that, they, they might know one or two arguments, but they don't know them all, especially if there are a bunch of good ones. You know, so uh, um, um, it's important to provide good arguments. Also, you might provide a bit of information or documentation that nobody else has. You might provide argument in a, in a nuanced way that nobody else has. So absolutely use your personal reasons, uh, but uh, don't assume that legislators know what the major arguments are. Now, when you're talking about oral testimony, definitely focus on your personal story. You've only got two or three minutes in the oral testimony. So, you know, that's what's going to have the most impact unless you are an expert in the field that you're talking about. Um, but in written testimony, provide the main arguments, and within the main arguments, weave in your personal story. I don't know if that'll help. Now, your, mile, your mileage may vary. If you've got a system that works for you, use it. But uh, this is what I've found to be effective over and over again. Um, make your arguments. Some of them might be redundant. They're not always going to be. And don't assume that your legislator knows what they all are, even if they're obvious to you. But yes, absolutely weave in your personal story. Do you have anything else, Ginger or Donna? Not for me, it's been very helpful. Okay. All right, Donna, I don't see anything new coming up on the chat window. So, okay, so uh, yep, I see that's helpful, so that's good. So. We're going to get out of here a little early today. It's 1.40, and so we started at 1.05, so that's pretty efficient use of time. So if you have any additional questions, go ahead and, and uh, contact me. The phone number and email address is on the westernlibertynetwork.org website. And don't forget about the other resources that you have on the www.westernlibertynetwork.org webpage. So uh, we'll see you next week, and uh, God bless, and have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thank you, Richard.